I actually want to, uh, you know, uh, turn to John and actually, you know, now, obviously, aside from traditional factors like age and, and bulk, you know, we have, uh, of course, things like, you know, IGHV status uh, and 17P deletion or 11Q deletion. Can you talk about how you integrate those factors in treatment decisions? Yeah, no, I, I think I, I really echo what, you know, what Michael just said about really not forgetting everything we've learned, say, for groups of patients that you know, if we were ta if we were talking about large cell lymphoma and we were saying, well, we're going to we're going to start with an oral drug that's easier, because even though CHOP is harder and we cure the disease, we wouldn't get any physicians to sign up or any any patients to sign up because you can cure the disease, but you cure the disease. And when the, the initial data from the MD Anderson on FCR with this long-term follow-up was presented. Uh, you know, it, it was a changing point for me and my practice. And then we had two other groups with shorter follow-up that replicated the same result in this IGVH mutated you know, group that there, the MD Anderson has the longest follow-up. But, you know, at 13 years, as Michael said, you know, two-thirds of the IGVH mutated patients are in remission. And, you know, there was a correlation in other work with that for minimal residual disease negativity at, at the end of therapy, and the Germans have reproduced this in, in their um, CLL8 study and you know, their medimustine rituximab versus FCR study. And so for me, the hardest counseling session is the patient who's, between, who's under 65 to 70, who's fit, who has IGVH mutated disease. I do that in all my patients, at least at the time of therapy. And I, I often do it at the beginning because it sort of gives patients help with deciding how the CLL is gonna affect them and it sort of will put them at ease. But if they're IGVH mutated, then you really have to have the hard sit down talk, you know, the pros of FCR. And you really, I think as well, you have to talk about what are the consequences. And, you know, and the consequences, although, they're, they're not common, they are real. You know, three, you know, three to five percent of patients will get a treatment-related myeloid neoplasia, and in our experience, virtually all of those patients die of that. Uh, and it, it, is a, it is a hard, harder therapy over six months than doing ibrutinib, but I agree with Michael, you're done then. And, you know, and so, and so, and it's a hard question. And I'm say I'm 50, I'm 51, and I go oscillate back and forth on what if patients ask, well, what would you do? As I say, in one week I'll say FCR, the next week, the next week I'll say targeted therapy. And so, but I agree with Michael that the 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 most common group that we see in our practice are the patients who are not candidates for FCR, based upon the disease. And you know, there we've really had two changes in therapy. You know, we have. Obinutuzumab, you know, obinutuzumab and clarambacil, which is, say is an active is an active drug, a combination for this patient group, and prolongs you know prolongs survival over clarambacil, hopefully never to be used as a control again in a randomized phase three study, and and um, it, but it, that's a good th that's a good option for patients, but we have the resonate you know, we have the resonate two study which looked at ibrutinib in this patient population. And it, it is encouraging that we're seeing that the durability of these patients now, you know, out beyond three years is holding to what, you know, Dr. O'Brien will be presenting at this, uh, you know, at this meeting. And, you know, to Michael's point, most of the people that have gone off of ibrutinib in the Resonate study have gone off for side effects. It hasn't been, you know, it hasn't been for progression. There are only a, a small number of progressions in that patient population. So I, IGVH mutational status is the most important thing for me in deciding therapy. You know, 17P is helpful. 17P is probably less helpful because you know, I'm probably not gonna go the direction of FCR in, in my IGVH unmutated patients, and 17P usually lies there. If they have 17P and they're mutated, they're really in that very uncommon group, then I, so I believe the mutation status or where the disease is born it, you know, in terms of where it originates, is probably more important than you know the the cytogenetics. Thank you. No, I think uh, it's remarkable to me and resonate too that that with longer follow up that this you know relative risk reduction of eighty four percent of a progression of death has actually improved yes. uh, over time and and that that there is this uh, you know the one question durability. for for Michael actually it, it, you noticed you mentioned that the seventeen p patients maybe don't see as seem as bad 
as, as we initially thought. And I'm wondering if that could be sort of, we've seen a similar story in large cell lymphoma where we're checking um, MYC and BCL2 by fish in everybody now. And previously it was 17P. I think we probably looked at the worst patients and said, well, they may be 17P. We checked it in them. When we check it in everybody, we dilute out the, uh, the, the, the numbers a little bit. Maybe that's why we're, they're looking better, perhaps. I, I, I think one of the things is that um, you never see someone with uh, loss of uh, both 17P regions. I think it's incompatible with life of the cell somehow. And, uh, and for a long time now, uh, since Danny Kotovsky and his group uh, said that, um, you know, about 20% uh, of the, uh, uh, the patients uh, uh, that are 17P deleted uh, will not have a mutation in the other allele so that you will have a functional P53 mechanism. And uh, the, uh, the curves are, uh, of time to progression, uh, a very uh, rapid fall off, but then there is almost like a hockey stick uh, that goes along so that you end up having more uh, patients with long-term uh, disease free than in the 11 Qs. Uh, so uh, in the 11 Q, by and large, is a very sensitive disease in young males, and uh, a reasonable number of them get to be MRD negative, but every single one of them relapses. And uh, so, uh, E even our measurement of, uh, you know, uh, uh, what's our goal? And if MRD negative, we'd say, oh, that's terrific. We achieved that in the 11 Qs. And then in the subtext, you just say, well, don't expect this to last very uh, long, uh, three, four years, et cetera, but it'll, it'll be coming back. <coughs> so that I think that one of the nice things is that we have a, a number of studies in uh, both lymphomas and in CLL at the present time that are really uh, studying uh, subsets very well. So we get an idea of the uh, historical uh, basis, uh, the expectation that we can have with new therapies uh, over time. And I, th I think particularly in follicular lymphoma and CLL, uh, it is really important that we keep on reporting longer and longer follow-up things because different things begin to appear. And uh, as time has gone on with the FCR, there are more and more patients that end up dying of other cancers. And what's the contribution of the therapy to that? And what's the contribution of the disease to the predisposition? They're very real questions. And I, I, I'm very happy that there are talented young investigators uh, coming along that can actually uh, do that follow-up.